In Abashiri Imperial Prison, built in 1890 to hold the most dangerous inmates as well as political prisoners, now turned into a museum, one can wander the corridors to observe the creepy, windowless dormitories and the tiny cells where the temperature could go down as low as minus 20 degrees Celsius. At the time, the prisoners were often tortured and the living conditions were nearly unbearable. In the solitary confinement corridor, we can now see the mannequin of a man wearing only a sort of white rag underwear, climbing towards the window rooftop via the wooden beams of the building. It represents none other than Yoshie Shiratori during his famous escape from what was known to be one of the most secured prisons at the time. Yoshie Shiratori became known as the man no prison could hold after he escaped four different times from some of the highest security prisons in Japan. His escapes brought attention to horrible conditions in Japan's prisons, as that was his reason for having never given up on escaping the cruel and inhumane treatments inflicted upon him and the other prisoners. But how did he do it? This is his story. Born in 1907 in Tsutsui in the prefecture of Aomori in the north of Japan, Yoshie had a fisherman father and a fish vendor mother. His father unfortunately was an alcoholic and died of a liver cirrhosis, cirrhosis, leaving Yoshie, his brother, sister and his mother with nothing more than a roof over their heads which would soon be taken away from them as they were housed by his father's former employer. His mother soon found a job in a farm and fell in love with the farmer there. The problem is that that he didn't want to be burdened by all of her kids and would only agree to raise the youngest, his little brother. So she was asked to find a solution for Yoshie and his sister and that's how he was sent to live with his aunt in Aomori where she held a little tofu shop. Too poor to send them to school, she had them help her out at her shop and Yoshie would be her little delivery boy, running all over town to deliver tofu to her clients. Eventually though, he found himself in a tough spot again as his sister had married and left just just like his aunt who had closed down her shop to join her new husband wherever she went. 18 at the time, Yoshie was hired to work on a crab fishing boat. It was a tough job where they were away for weeks or months at a time, but he managed to save up some money and open a small fish shop at 22. He got married and had a daughter. They were doing good and getting by until the political situation and world crisis that would culminate into World War II hit Japan and he was forced to close down shop. The crab fishing ships also stayed in and he was basically jobless. He started playing mahjong and making a little cash here and there, kind of ripping off some newbies. And little by little he began to hang out with small-time gangsters, which were actually mostly jobless fishermen just like him, trying to make ends meet and feed their families. But nonetheless, they were doing it the shady way. One of his first friends was Akinori. He was 14 years old and an orphan who had already been to jail for different little crimes he'd committed. Eventually, Akinori would ask Yoshie if he wanted to rob a little grocery store owner by the name of Kato Susumu. They made it into his grocery store unnoticed one night and only found a few things here and there to rob. But his money wasn't inside the shop, so they left, a little disappointed. They decided to go back after they had questioned a former employee of his who had revealed to them that the day's money was kept under a pile of clothes in the old man's room above the shop. They also incidentally found out that the 67-year-old man was retired from the military and knew a thing or two about defending himself. In fact, he slept with a katana sword by his bed and knew how to use it. But they decided to go through with it anyways. That night, while Akinori was stealing the money, Shiratori thought he'd take the katana sword. He could maybe sell it later, he thought. But as he picked up the sword, the cloth that was wrapped around it unwound and hit the old man in the face. Of course, he woke up instantly and went after them as they tried to escape. The front door being locked, he caught up with them. He attacked Shiratori, beating him with a stick and Akinori, who was in front, turned back to help Yoshie. He picked up the sword and cut Kato's back over 30 centimeters long. He then used his own dagger to stab the old man in the lower back and they escaped. Kato was taken to the hospital and not long after he had described them to the cops, he died from his wounds. Shiratori exchanged the old man's sword for a couple of false testimonies that succeeded in getting Akinori out of jail as he had just been arrested. 
They were back to their little mischiefs and crimes until 1935 when the Kenpei Tai, which was the political police of the emperor, arrived in the area. At the time, Akinori had once again been arrested and he'd pretty much told the police that Shiratori was responsible for the old man's death to get a shorter sentence. Yoshie's fake slash bought testimonies had blabbed as well, so he found himself forced to confess to a crime that he would go on to claim that he hadn't committed until the end of his life. And on the 1st of June of 1936, he was transferred to Aomori prison, where he was sentenced to life in prison. On the 18th of June, so merely 17 days after his arrival, he was ready for his first escape. He had stolen a metal wire that was destined for the prisoners to hang their uniform while in the showers and had bent it into every possible shape until he'd found the one that would open his prison cell. Then he'd carefully studied the ins and outs of the guards, their rotations and their breaks. On that day, he'd chosen the right moment to open his cell and make his way out of the prison without getting noticed. He then ran towards the forest and he was free. But the authorities deployed all of their resources and more to find him and bring him back. He was referred to as a dangerous killer on the loose and so 3,086 civilians volunteered to go and look for him. On top of the 1,200 policemen, the 3,346 firemen and the 1,703 soldiers who were already put to the task. He would walk during the night and sleep during the day as to avoid being spotted as much as possible. But on the 21st of June, he was signaled as a hobo by a city employee who was patrolling. He was sleeping in a cemetery, so of course he was arrested again and gained two extra years of solitary confinement as punishment for his escape. His lawyer got this down to six months, though. In April 1937, he was transferred to the Miyagi High Security Prison. He was placed in a six square meter concrete cell until his transfer to Kozuge Prison in Tokyo, known to be more laid back and cozy, thanks to his lawyer. However, due to the war, he was eventually transferred to the Akita Prison in the northern west of Japan. He was to be placed amongst the most dangerous prisoners and the ones who had already attempted to escape. His quote-unquote revolutionary cell was supposed to be escape-proof. The walls were made out of concrete covered in riveted metal plates. The ceiling had a grid for a window without the glass so the cold could get in. All winter long, he would train himself to climb the walls, kind of like Spider-Man, you know, to reach the grid window above. Don't know how he did that, but he did. So, yeah. Once again, he used a little metal wire he'd stolen and a tiny construction metal plate that he'd turned into a blade, MacGyver style, and he started sawing the grid off that ceiling window. On the 5th of June, he'd heard talk about a typhoon coming to town and he decided it was on that day that he would escape. He had successfully sawn the window grid and he was able to climb out of his cell through the ceiling and get out through the roof unnoticed. He was finally free. He worked all night so he wouldn't get caught this time and by morning he had arrived to a small village. He stole some clothes, some food and started a long walk along the train tracks on the way to Tokyo. He would walk like that during three months at nights and sleep during the daytime. By the end of September of 1942 he was entering Tokyo by uh, Saitama. However, unfortunately for him, during a routine ID check by the police, he was placed under arrest again, then transferred to jail again, but this time to the Abashiri jail, the worst prison there was in the north of Hokkaido, the coldest and most hostile place there was. So on the 23rd of April of 1943, he was transferred there and placed in a special cell where the floor and walls were made of concrete covered with a riveted steel plate. The only opening there was, was a small 20 by 40 centimeter rectangle on the metal door. He was shackled day and night, forbidden from daily walks and even from showering. A few days after his arrival, the ward came to see him and told him that he would be the one that would cut off his wings and put a stop to his escapes. Without any exercise and with the food he was allowed, he rapidly lost a lot of weight and was soon able to remove his shackles on his own. One day, as he was listening in on what was going on in the corridor, he thought the guard bringing them the meals was alone and so he attempted an escape when the guard brought him his meal. 
there were actually two other guards serving meals at the other end of the corridor, so he was immediately apprehended, beaten up, and sent to the box for a week. The box was a sort of tiny house where an inmate was sent when he did something wrong, and he would have to stand there as there was not enough space for him to lay down or even sit in some cases. If the inmate had attacked a guard, he would also receive a bucket of cold water over the head each night, and mind you, it was often minus 20 degrees Celsius out there. Of course, there was no heating, so oftentimes inmates would die there. Fortunately for Yoshie, he survived the ordeal and was sent back to his cell. But this time, his ankles were also shackled. He had to eat like an animal, with his head in the bowl. He couldn't relieve himself into the bucket properly either, so he was forced to remain soiled for days. In the summer, the miso soup splashing over the shackles had them starting to rust, which gave Yoshie an idea. What if he could use that to his advantage? It would take time, who knows if it would even work? But he had no other choice, and he was determined to get out of this hellhole. Eventually, one of the screws began to loosen up. The window frame in the door had similar type of screws that also started to rust as he would spit his soup over them every day. Months later, by June 1944, the window frame started to yield and he could remove his shackles as he pleased. On the 26th of August, he was ready. He must have somehow gained their trust enough so that they would remove the ankle shackles because I haven't heard of them in this escape, you know, but apparently they weren't there anymore. So during the 9 p.m. rotation, he freed his hands and he dislocated his own shoulder to get through the small window cavity that was in the door of his cell. He climbed the door and kept on climbing over the beams until he exited the building through the rooftop window. He MacGyvered his way over the the prison wall and ran. He ran all through the night and found an abandoned hut. He used a blanket there to make himself some clothes and found a small village nearby where he could steal some food supplies and other blankets and clothes. He decided he would live at night and sleep during the day to avoid getting caught again. He spent the winter there, then another year following that. In the summer of 1946, he found out the war was over and Japan had lost. Tired of being alone, he made his way toward the town of Sapporo, on foot of course. On the road, he came across a young hooligan dressed up as a policeman who tried to rob him, but Shiratori didn't let him and ended up wounding him with a knife. The young man was then brought to the hospital where he succumbed to his wounds unfortunately that very night. He had, however, enough time to describe Shiratori to the officers, and consequently, he was arrested yet again on the 12th of August in Sapporo. He was charged with the murder of the young man, despite his claims of it being self-defense. On the 12th of December of 1946, he was sentenced to death. He told the judge he would do everything to escape again, as he considered his sentence to be injustice. So once again, he is sent to prison. Sapporo prison, where the ward had a special cell constructed just for him. It was outside the main building and it was guarded 24-7. Once again, concrete walls, no windows, but a wooden floor this time, underneath which Shiratori found soil, and rather soft soil at that. So once again, he built himself a tool to saw the wooden floorboards and he stole a miso soup bowl from the guards to dig his tunnel. On the 31st of March, he saw the light of day on the other side. He waited until nighttime, when the guards were a bit less attentive or more distracted, to do it again. At 10 p.m., he was free. The guards noticed, but too late. He was free again. He ran to an abandoned hut where he spent his first night and his first day. Then he came across another village, a ski village for people who had comfortable living conditions. He took what he needed and spent a month in a cave until he found an old hut where he spent the summer. He had to keep going back to the ski village to steal what he needed though, and he found himself to be too close to civilization for comfort. So he decided to move further, but with the snow starting to fall, the winter coming in, he had to head to Tehine, I hope that's how you say it, where he spent three months almost snowed in with barely any food to survive. On the 19th of January, exhausted from all of this, he walked to Kotoni, a suburb of Sapporo, and went over to two policemen who were smoking, asking them if they could spare a cigarette. When he was granted a cigarette, he cracked and told them who he was. He told them he was surrendering because he was tired. His story was told all over the country and people were actually sympathetic towards him. 
Thanks to those who felt they could lend him a hand in funding his lawyer fees, he was able to have a great lawyer this time around, and that changed the outcome of his trial. His death sentence was turned into a 20-year sentence. He was 41 at the time, and he was sent to a much more comfortable prison, the minimal security prison of Futyo in Tokyo. The ward there was friendly towards him and even taught him to read and write. He became responsible for the library there and his cell was not even locked anymore because they were sure that he would not escape again. In December 1961, he was free. At last. And for real this time. He was 54 and was greeted by a woman he had been corresponding with and who had supported him. They went to live in Hokkaido, where he had grown up and where he knew his daughter lived. He didn't dare talk to her at first for years for fear of rejection due to his criminal record. I don't know if he ended up doing it or not, but he died of a heart attack at the age of 71 years old. And that's the life of Yoshie Shiratori. I hope you learned something. If you did, and if you found the video interesting, if you liked the podcast format as well, let me know in the comments below give it a like and subscribe for more. Have a good one and I will see you very, very soon. Bye!